Hello and welcome to the SOT virtual poster session presented by Alta Sciences. We have just a few announcements before we begin. The slides are going to advance automatically throughout the presentation. And at the bottom of your browser, you'll find a help icon for technical assistance. If your screen freezes or the slides don't appear to be advancing as they should, please try exiting and restarting the session as it may be an issue with your connectivity. And as a reminder, you can submit questions at any time using the Q&A window on your screen, and we'll address questions and answers at the, each, at the end of each presentation. My name is Tina Rogers, and I'm the Vice President of Preclinical Sciences at Alta Sciences, and I'll be the moderator of these sessions today. So just a few words about Alta Sciences. We are a forward-thinking, mid-sized contract research organization offering pharmaceutical and biotechnology companies a proven, flexible approach to preclinical and clinical pharmacology studies, including formulations, manufacturing, and analytical services. Alta Sciences' full-service solutions include bioanalysis, program management, medical writing, biostatistics, and data management, all tailored to specific sponsor requirements. Alta Sciences helps sponsors get better drugs to the people who need them faster. So our first three presentations are related to in-life procedures and data collection in toxicology studies. And as you can see on the slide, these are the three presentations that are going to be given. So our first speaker is Mark Campbell. Uh, Mark Campbell is a study director and research scientist at Alta Sciences. He joined the company in 2018. Mark directs studies in all species, supporting programs in both small and large molecules and other biologics. With over 15 years of preclinical industry experience and an additional seven years in clinical research, Mark brings a well-balanced skill set to the Alta Sciences team. Prior to joining Alta Sciences, Mark was a senior project manager in the CRO division of a local clinical diagnostic lab. And Mark's topic today is feasibility assessment of subcutaneous radio telemetry device implantation in cinemalgus monkeys. Mark? Thank you, Tina. Uh, and thanks everybody for joining us for these presentations today. Uh, the title of my presentation is Feasibility Assessment of Subcutaneous Radio Telemetry Device Implantation in Cinemologous Monkeys. Uh, the objective of this study was to evaluate the feasibility and functionality of subcutaneously implanted DSI Physiotel radio telemetry devices to measure cardiovascular function and body temperature in uh, conscious cinemologous monkeys. And so what we did was compare the data attained from those uh, subcutaneously implanted devices to a standard control gr uh, group, which had the standard abdominal implants. Uh, the test system was cinemologous monkeys of Cambodian origin. Uh, these were non-naive stock animals. Um, we had a fairly large uh, age and weight range in this study, um, two to five years old and two to six kilograms in body weight and all animals underwent some screening, which involved a physical exam, clinical pathology baseline, uh, and ECG and thorax x-rays. Um, environmental conditions for these animals were individual housing, and the group sizes were four animals per group. We had two animals uh, of each gender in each group. Uh, methods involved were animals were implanted with the DSI uh, Physiotel digital series model M11 transmitters. They were implanted either intra-abdominally or subcutaneously, and the surgeries were done according to testing facility SOPs and the DSI uh, surgical manual. Um, animals were allowed to recover for a minimum of 21 days before we began monitoring. Some animals uh, had an additional week of recovery. Um, telemetry data that we recorded consisted of ECG parameters, which included the RR interval, PR interval, QRS duration, QT interval, and corrected QT. 
Um, we also recorded systolic blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure, mean arterial pressure, heart rate, and body temperature. And additionally, we collected weekly body weights, rectal temperatures, and clinical pathology panels. Those were all taken on the same day as the ECG recordings were done. Um, results that we see received trace-wise from both implant sites were roughly similar. You can see that the, uh, the waveforms were not significantly different between groups. Um, these two pictures are just kind of representations of, of the traces that we received from each. Um, and the subcutaneous implant, implant group showed no differences um, compared to the standard abdominal implant in either quality or parameters measured. Um, here's just a, kind of a brief summary of the results we received. Uh, in these histograms, the error bars are one standard deviation, plus or minus. So you can see that the, because of the small group sizes, there is a fair bit of, of variability in these, uh, these results. But between the two groups, intra-abdominal in, are in green, subcutaneous are in orange. Um, not really a whole lot of difference between any of these parameters. You'll see the heart rate is roughly similar across the six weeks mean arterial pressure doesn't change a whole lot. Um, it's slightly higher in the subcutaneous groups on weeks three and four, and slightly lower in groups five and six, but you will see that there's a fair bit of variation in those groups when you look at the error bars. RR interval, um, pretty cons consistent across groups, and same with PR interval, QS, QRS duration, and QT interval are all roughly the same. We also recorded mean temperatures in these animals. Um, Intra-abdominal implants showed uh, body temperatures that were approximately one and a half degrees lower than the, sub, uh, than the rectal temperatures recorded in those same animals, whereas in the subcutaneous implants, uh, the body temperatures were often three to four degrees lower than rectal temperatures. So there is a bit of variability with the temperatures recorded at the implant site. Um, and we did see that there was some additional variability in temperature uh, results that were recorded by the implants following week three. Uh, changes in clinical pathology were pretty consistent with low-grade inflammation, which is secondary to an implantation surgery. Um, and the pattern and the extent of these alterations were comparable across both implantation sites. And the feasibility of sustaining the subcutaneous implant placement was a bit limited by the animal size. It seemed like the larger males, which were approximately four and a half to five kilograms, tolerated the subcutaneous implants really well, whereas some of the smaller females, three kilograms and, and slightly smaller than that, didn't really tolerate the implants as well, and we did actually have to euthanize one of the female animals because of repeated uh, reopening of the surgical site. So the conclusions that we arrived at were that subcutaneous telemetry implants appear to be a viable alternative to intra-abdominal implants in non-human primates of sufficient size, but are perhaps not ideal for animals that are three kilograms or less. Uh, the changes in clinical pathology parameters were consistent with low-grade inflammation and were comparable across both implantation sites. And the subcutaneous implant technique did provide electrocardiographic recordings that were comparable to intra-abdominally placed devices and were accurate for the analysis of any abnormalities that might take place. Uh, I want to thank my co-authors on this presentation, Julie Forget, Stefan Nachev, Anthony Solori, Brett McGrath, Terevio Hernandez and Tina Rogers, all from Alta Sciences, as well as Dr. Larry Tilley from VetMed Consultants. And that is the end of my presentation, and we can open up the floor for a few questions. Um, I do have a couple of questions that have been handed to me. <clears throat> One question that has been asked is, could I go into a little bit more detail about the issues that we saw with the smaller animals. Um, the implantation site of these 
uh, subcutaneous pumps was kind of in the hip and the small of the back region. So the, the smaller females, um, in, with the cytomologous monkeys, these are relatively thin, kind of lanky animals. Um, there really isn't a good uh, large subcutaneous space to kind of hide that implant in. And the skin of the cinemologous monkeys is, is relatively thin. It's almost like paper. So there isn't kind of a nice layer of fascia that can act as a sort of a cushion for those animals. So for the smaller females, um, it, it was quite an in, intrusive uh, implantation. Um, we did see pressure sores over the implant site and things like that. The larger males, it was much easier to hide the implant in a place where it wasn't wasn't um, you know as obvious, so uh, that's what we we saw with those. Um, an additional question that I have is, uh, how long do we think these uh, implants will remain viable? Um, as I stated, we did give the animals a three to four week recovery period after implantation, and then we monitored the results from the telemetry devices for six weeks after that. So we followed them out to about 10 weeks and didn't really see any degradation in the quality of the data we were obtaining from those. Um, uh, so we really don't have any reason to believe uh, that that would degrade further over the short term, but we really haven't tested sort of really long-term viability of these implants. Um, I think that's all we have time for for my presentation today, so we can turn it back over to Tina. Our next presentation is from Anthony Solori. Anthony is an associate scientist and study director at Alta Sciences. He joined the company in 2015, and he's been conducting and directing GLP preclinical toxicology and related research with seven years' experience. Anthony has experience with both small and large molecules. Uh, he has experience in general toxicology, dose range finding, and safety pharmacology and JET ECG, as well as infusion, male reproduction, and model development. Anthony's been a key player in expanding Alta Sciences' safety pharmacology program and other technological capabilities. And Anthony's presentation is the establishment of a historical database for normal cinemologous macaque spermatozoa evaluation in male reproductive toxicology studies. Anthony? All right. Thank you, Tina. And hello to everybody out there tuning in for now. Uh, my name is Anthony Solori. I'm an associate scientist and study director. I've been involved with our reproductive toxicology studies, specifically male repro, for the past four or five years now. And to give a little background on why we kind of wanted to look at the normal cinemologous sperm, we were updating some of our training information here, and a question kept popping up over and over again. is just, what does a normal macaque sperm look like? And although we had some internal images and some other training materials, a few of us sort of sat down to sort of look at some of the you know, published research out there and sort of discovered that there really wasn't a lot to base our work off of. So... We first started looking at some of the guidelines out there for male reproductive toxicology and noticed that even within the language of that guidance itself, it talks about non-human primate research not really being robust. And so we first started looking at some of our sort of core procedural documentation where we actually get our data from, how it's processed. And you'll notice that a lot of your sort of common CROs, a lot of those procedures are t tend to be based off the World Health Organization's Laboratory Manual for Humans. It's a great resource for the sort of standardization of procedures and has a, is great for training purposes and gives tons of information. However, it is, of course, a human document. It's meant for largely IVF uh, facilities, you know, helping, you know, couples out there get uh, pregnant and have, you know, children. So it's not really geared towards our purposes as sort of this general screening for toxicological purposes. So sort of looking around at all the data we had, we've been performing sort of this type of research for over 10 years. So we just wanted to take a look at whatever we could, to sort of get a rough idea as to what sort of the normal macaque sperm looks like, the normal macaque sperm behavior, just to sort of help us understand and give some better reference to some of the data that we're seeing. And so we looked at over 400 animals over the past uh, 10 years. And sort of in, to help compare, you'll see uh, in the next couple of slides, uh, a little comparison against the human reference ranges that the, the WHO has published, just sort of get an idea of like how uh, 
you know, although we are very closely related to, to NHPs, how that data still will look quite a bit different from what we expect from some of that information. So just to briefly go over how uh, some of these studies were performed, all of our animals were aged between 48 years, either Cambodian or Chinese. We lumped everybody in together just to get that rough uh, information. And everyone was housed and or had semen collected in the exact same way per standard regulations and all the collections were done via direct penile stimulation. All of the computerized analysis was done with either the Toxivos or IVOS2 systems using the identical calculations between the two systems uh, just because the IVOS2 is you know, a little bit more powerful uh, and has come up in recent years. We're sort of switching over to that. And then lastly, for sperm morphology, everything was counted uh, for up to 200 cells, uh, just under a light microscope by the trained staff. And getting into sort of our first general area, is sperm motility. It's sort of the most, uh, one of the two most common measurements that you'll find in a sort of male reproductive toxicology study. We looked at 608 animals, and we found that, at least compared to humans, uh, at least a rough comparison to humans, there seems to be a little more variability, at least in the data that we have, and potentially a slightly higher level of motility. Uh, overall, this is kind of what we sort of expected to see, and really sort of helps us understand that, like, on, on average, that most sperm for animals are motile, but you can see with that green uh, graph on the right, but there is still quite a large range between the minimum and maximum you're seeing. And a lot of, if you are concerned from a more scientific perspective on, you know, making sure that the animals you're using are fairly motile, it is fairly easy to, no to notice when you have that low motility, that 30% minimum you're seeing at the bottom. Uh, however, you know, it, it was really that sort of variability, uh, inter-animal variability that seems to be a little bit higher than humans that we really wanted to sort of highlight and point out just for your studies. And the second measurement that we're looking at is sperm concentration alongside motility, one of the two values that you're going to see most commonly in all male reproductive studies. And from the 357 animals that we looked at for this sort of parameter, we were definitely the most surprised with the results that we were seeing, at least compared to humans. Just the number of cells, you know, in each sample, the variability between the animals is just absolutely out of this world, basically, from what we were expecting. And so for a sort of general study purposes, although it's good to keep in mind, this actually helps us explain a little bit more of our sort of procedural difficulties that we see every now and again. The higher concentration you see can, you know, make morphology screening more difficult and can also make sort of motility screening more difficult as it, you know, hinders the ability to measure um, individual cells moving around a field. But definitely just to keep in mind that large amount of cells in that, in these samples is something that may need a little more research going into the future. And now lastly, we'll move on to sperm morphology. Uh, definitely, when compared to motility and concentration, you won't see this parameter sort of assessed as much. However, it can be useful if you see major changes in sort of cell shape and structure. Uh, what you see on the screen there is sort of what we feel like the typical uh, morphology slide sort of looks like, at least the ideal sperm morphology slide. You can see each of the individual sperm sort of fairly clearly alongside their tails. And if you look, we have a couple of sort of common findings that we'll go over in a moment. That A box sort of in the center showing your sort of typical normal sperm with the elongated tail, no loops, no bends, the head's a nice oval shape, things of that nature. And then going into B at the top, you see the tail is starting to sort of loop around itself. It's sort of making just a, some sort of circular shape. Although this sperm may be perfectly healthy, definitely when you're looking at a normal sperm, you want to see that sort of elongated, sort of straight to sort of slightly, maybe slightly curved uh, tail. Uh, so we do count this as an abnormal sperm. However, it is fairly common. Uh, but the sort of more extreme version of that you see in the bottom left square is C. It will be your coiled tail. This is more of a extreme version of it. Although this cell is definitely alive and maybe wiggling around, it definitely won't be able to move as well. Um, with that tail just looped around itself over and over and over again. Uh, this is another one of the more common ones we'll go over in a moment. But then lastly, another common finding we'll see in that box on the right is just a head with no tail. Although there's, there's definitely cases where the tail may not grow or attach properly, this is also a great reference point for the sort of quality of the slides that are being generated if you're ever examining this on your own. If you see an abnormally high amount of uh, tailless heads, it could be a measure of 
you know, if the tails are actually being popped off uh, during this creation of the morphology slide itself, or it could be a sign that there is some sort of issue with the sort of tail formation. However, and as you see in this table, those tailless heads basically, although they do pop up in about 24% of the population, the big thing to look out for is just tail abnormalities. Even just that loop tail we saw in every single one of the animals of the 136 that we looked at, um, some sort of tail abnormality was present. Now, the actual percentage of which, so you can see at that top, that loop tail, um, although it appeared in 100% of the population of the abnormalities present in each animal, it averaged out at about half of the abnormalities present. Um, definitely, although maybe common, maybe isn't quite serious. You know, you're more concerned about the motility and concentration in these particular circumstances. Uh, but an important thing to keep in mind if you're ever reviewing sort of these morphology slides or morphology data coming from your CRO is basically that these tail abnormalities are definitely going to be common if our data is anything to show for. Um, so it may even be a little more valuable to you or valuable to sort of the technicians to keep an eye out for sort of non-tail abnormalities uh, just as a measure of sort of adverse reaction to your test article or whatever you're looking for. So we sort of talk generally about, um, especially the morphology results, uh, like I mentioned a moment ago, the tail abnormalities are incredibly common. So the non-tail abnormalities may be a little more useful if you're seeing your acrosomes disappearing or for some reason a bunch of heads start sprouting up when they're not supposed to. These are things you might want to watch out for. Uh, but it's important to point out that unlike motility and concentration, we didn't compare um, or at least provide a comparison to the human data for this just because the way that your sort of your typical preclinical screening functions over the sort of human IVF is, is very different. For human, for human screening, they're looking at everything from sort of head width to tail length. It's a very, very strict repeated measurement. Whereas for our purposes, we're just trying to give our clients an idea of like, is, are there potentially changes to the morphology of the cell coming out just so that when you move into the clinic, that data, you can have an eye out for that data in, in humans specifically. And then just to sort of wrap up everything, um, to sort of reiterate, especially with that motility and concentration data, just to make sure whenever you're reviewing your data to keep an eye out for the intra-animal variability. Uh, it may prop up uh, significantly, like in the case of our concentration data where we're looking at matters of, you know, a few million to a couple hundred million um, cells per field. Uh, but one thing that we did definitely notice is that uh, for our particular collections, each animal was sort of assessed based off of one collection. And so we didn't really have any great means of sort of identifying re repeated collections. If there was any sort of way to see if these values sort of are consistent between animals or if, the, if there's other factors at play, whether it's the sort of training of the animal itself to the procedure, if they, you know, if any of these values change over time or uh, if the time or if the values change with the age of the animal over time, there's still quite a bit more information that we can look into when it comes to this sort of data. And then, although with specifically going back to how we generate those procedures for sort of the, in our training for our staff here, although that WHO manual is great for sort of giving you the basis for sort of developing your staining slot or your staining procedures, how you know, just deciding, you know, the motility ca calculations that you're going to be using, uh, we, there still is quite a bit more to learn about just the macaque itself. Um, just using that particular guide gives a lot of great information, but it still sort of pertains a lot to humans. So we definitely need to sort of expand what we're looking at in order to, with monkeys specifically, in order to have like a, in order to provide better data for these male reproductive toxicology studies. And that sort of concludes that presentation, and we will take some questions from you all. And to start off with, it uh, looks like uh, our first question has to do with learning everything that we have now. Is there anything that you would specifically change when it comes to designing your studies? There isn't any particular area where I feel like the data sort of suggests changing your, so your typical design. It's just important to keep in mind that there may be sort of a significant amount of variability between your groups naturally, and that it may be especially helpful to sort of get those multiple measurements during your baseline sort of assessments, just to make sure you have like a 
a clear understanding of the each individual animal's sort of sperm counts and uh, sort of characteristics just because there is that high amount of variability. You want to make sure what you're looking at um, is fairly accurate. There is sort of some research out there uh, suggesting that there is serious issues with the statistical power of these male reproductive study designs, especially since you're only working typically with three to four animals per group. Um, so just sort of keeping an eye on those, making sure that whatever data you do get, um, you're absolutely confident in it. Uh, it's probably the most important thing you can really um, take from that. And then the second question coming in is, you mentioned a few times that the motility and concentration was sort of more common than the morphology. Can you elaborate a little bit? Uh, definitely. Uh, so on your average male repro study, uh, the motility and concentration is definitely more common just because it gives you sort of the most amount of information. I mean, sure, morphology is definitely important. You want to make sure your cells are healthy, but if, you know, if your cells can't make it to your egg, there's no point, you know, in uh, sort of a, there isn't really much use in that data. You want to make sure your sperm can move. You want to make sure there's, there's enough sperm to fertilize the egg, essentially. Um, so there's just more uh, useful, more common to, than the other, than morphology is. There's not that there's any less value in it, really. And our final speaker for this session is Noreen Lalayeva. Noreen is a principal scientist and study director with Alta Sciences. She joined the company in 2005 and has more than 10 years' experience directing and conducting GLP preclinical toxicology studies. Noreen has experience with small and large molecules, and she's, she has targeted experience in toxicology, uh, DART, and in NHPs and small animals. Noreen has been also instrumental in the development of Alta Science's DART background data set. Noreen's topic today is procedure development for repeat infusions in juvenile monkeys. Noreen? Thank you, Tina. Um, hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us for this presentation. My name is Noreen Laliva, and I will be talking to you today about the procedure that we have developed at Alta Sciences for repeat IV infusions in juvenile monkeys. So a bit of a background. In the last several years, we have seen an increase in study designs that are aimed at targeting the pediatric market. This necessitates the use of younger and smaller animals for chronic tox studies. If you have subcutaneous or oral dose routes for your drug, then this is an easy adjustment for the lab to make. However, things can get more complicated when the drug needs to be delivered intravenously and even more so when the duration of dosing increases from a bolus injection to a prolonged infusion. In order to accommodate our clients and provide them with meaningful data, we've developed a very robust method that allowed us to administer doses to animals as young as six months via um, an IV infusion of up to one hour in duration. This method required brainstorming and collaboration across multiple groups to ensure that it was scientifically sound and most importantly, that we kept animal welfare at the forefront of all of our considerations. So this was the challenge we were facing. For those that are familiar with our setup at Alta Sciences, you know that we use procedure cages as a restraint method for our study procedures, such as blood collections, dose administrations, and many others. For a routine IV infusion, we would secure all of the four limbs to restrict movement and allow us to act the access to the upper limbs, which are most commonly used for dosing, and the lower limbs, which we most commonly use for blood collection. However, with animals as young as six months, there are two issues with this approach. One is restraining the limbs in this way can be very stressful for the kids. And two, they're simply too young and too small to fit into the procedure cage safely and prevent any possible injuries. So to address this issue, we've developed the snuggle wrap method, which allows the animals to remain immobile during dose administration, but it still gives the techs 
access to the limbs for dosing. This method kind of mimics swaddling of a baby, which is known to have a very calming effect. So the strategy was as follows. Um, we needed to create a cohesive design for this method that provided and promoted functionality and comfort for the animals. We needed to figure out what equipment we might need, what supplies we might have to order. We had to review all of the current SOPs and see if any of them needed to be updated to accommodate this new method. And obviously, we had to train the technical staff on this new procedure. All of this, once again, was done uh, via collaboration with many different groups and under strict supervision by our IACUC group as well to ensure that, once again, animal welfare was considered and was always at the forefront of all of the decision making. This slide lists some of the supplies that are used during this method, and you'll be able to see them better in the slides when um, the pictures are actually available to review. So to develop this method, we have used six age appropriate juvenile animals that we had in stock that have had previous exposure to interaction with technical teams. And the snuggle, so first we had to acclimate the animals to this new procedure, and we've done that over a period of two weeks. So animals were snuggled once every other day for a two-week period, and each time with each section, we increased the duration of the procedure until at the end we were snuggling them for up to one hour to mimic the proposed study design. During each session, positive reinforcements such as treats and toys were provided to the study animals. In addition, we have also measured rectal temperatures to ensure that animals were not overheating during the snuggle procedure. And we confirmed that the average body temperature 30 minutes into each session remained within the acceptable range for the age-matched animals. So now you get to see the pictures of our little babies. So the first picture you actually see are little snuggle wrap. So the black portion inside, this is the receiving blanket. So animals were first swaddled, much like you would swaddle a baby into a receiving, into a receiving blanket. And then one limb, either the upper or lower limb, was left out to be available for catheter placement. The animal was then wrapped into the blue snuggle wrap that you see on the screen in the second and then the third picture. In the first picture, you see that on top of the snuggle wrap, we have placed a color cage card that included study-specific animal number, the group number, study number, anything that would help us to ensure that animal identification was always visible and available for cross-reference. The animals were then placed on a restrained board which has room for four animals, as you see in that middle picture. And then those restrained boards can be placed next to each other and to accommodate a larger size study, as you see in the third picture. For studies such as this and for this method of dose administration, we've designated a separate room for this procedure to which the animals were transferred. So we not, did not perform this procedure in the same room where the animals are housed. As you can also see on the third picture, the infusion pumps were placed above the animals so that once again, you can easily cross-reference the syringe setting, the information on each syringe, and then the animal with the information on an animal's cage card. Each set of four animals was assigned one technician whose responsibility was to monitor the animal's behavior to ensure that they were given positive reinforcement and to also make sure that the doses were administered appropriately, that there were no kinks in the line, that the pumps did not stall. And as I said, for each four animals, we had one technician that was assigned to do just that. So to summarize, um, we were able to implement a stress-reduced method for juvenile NHPs with animal welfare at the forefront of all of our considerations. This method was successfully used in the 52-week chronic study in which we dosed animals once weekly for up to one hour via an IV infusion, 
And the animals for that study were six months of age at the time of dose initiation. And then most recently, we've also successfully completed a study where the animals were as young as three months of age at the time um, of dose initiation. So that brings me to the end of my presentation, and I would be happy to take some questions at this time. Okay. Um, oh, this is a good question. Um, the question is, how long do the animals need to be dosed with this method? So the main determination of when the animals are ready to graduate to the routine procedure cage is the weight and to some extent the age of the animal. Once the animal gained sufficient weight and got close to about, I would say, one year of age, they were moved to a routine procedure cage. Once again, because we were concerned about animal welfare and we always, that is always a consideration for everything that we do, we've initially placed two cage mates into the same procedure cage next to each other during dosing. So this allowed the animals to acclimate to this new environment new procedure, new restraint method with having their study buddy right next to them. And um, the animals were still small enough that they fit safely within the procedure cage. And then once they got a little bit older, um, maybe about 1.6 years of age or so, um, they were able to graduate to being to the, in the procedure cages by themselves. Okay, time for one more question. Okay. Um, is there a limit to the number of animals that can be dosed using the snuggle method? Um, that depends entirely on the size of the study. Um, what we have taken into consideration when designing our studies here was um, obviously the number of animals, and we thought what would work best for us was to stagger the animals so we dosed all of the male animals on one day and all of the female animals on the next day. And this, once again, allowed us to really concentrate and narrow down our attention to individual animals to make sure that they were comfortable and the doses were administered appropriately. And uh, this is all that I have for today. Thank you for your time. If you have any follow-up questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. Have a nice day and stay healthy. So welcome to session number two. Uh, these presentations are related to immunological endpoints in toxicology studies. The first speaker for our second session is Vivian Bunker. Vivian is a study director and research scientist at Alta Sciences. She joined the company in 2018. She has over 15 years of CRO industry experience, including uh, working as a quality assurance auditor, a study director for veterinary medicine, a laboratory technician for radio tracer studies, and a technician for in-life procedures. In her current role, she manages a variety of preclinical studies, both GLP and non-GLP, including general toxicology, safety pharmacology, and toxicokinetic studies. Vivian's topic today is comparing cytokine data to in-life parameters on non-human primates in non-clinical toxicology studies. Vivian? Thank you, Tina. And thank you, everyone, for joining in and taking time out of your day. I'd like to share with you all my poster on comparing cytokine data to in-life parameters on NHPs in non-clinical toxicology studies. Cytokines are important immunoregulatory proteins associated with innate and adaptive immunity. Currently, they are gaining attention in the industry for safety assessment, especially with large molecule drugs. But there are challenges with interpreting cytokine data. A few examples include species-specific reactions, individual variations, dose-response relationships, and unanticipated immunotoxicity. For these reasons, cytokines are generally not considered ideal standalone biomarkers in safety assessment. The objectives of this project was to use cytokine data collected during several studies and compare their values with what was observed among the animals in relation to clinical daily observations, body weights, and clinical pathology assessments. The poster describes data from several studies with a focus on two in particular. To start with a general overview, some clinical pathology parameters of interest in regard to inflammation are listed here. Elevations in any of these parameters can point to a potential immune response or infection, especially C-reactive protein and neutrophils. 
And here's a list of a few common cytokine or chemokines and their role in the immune response. Now to clarify, all chemokines are a type of cytokines. Not all cytokines are chemokines. In general, cytokines act similarly to neurotransmitters with cell signaling. For example, when a cell is responding to inflammation, it will release IL-6 into the system, which will then bind to appropriate receptors on other cells, triggering a cascade of events. Chemokines are a little different in that they attract neutrophils or monocytes to their intended location by emitting a kind of chemical trail. Imagine, if you will, a game of hot and cold or breadcrumb trail. The cells follow the trail to their intended location of where the injury or inflammation is. Now, for these studies that we looked at, the test system was all cinemologous monkeys of either Chinese or Cambodian origin. A mix of naive or non-naive animals were included, meaning some may have been dosed with a compound previously from the study of focus. Animals were of average age and weight and were all considered healthy for use on study. All animals were also socially housed. Serum was used for cytokine analyses and clinical pathology assessments with the serum chemistries. Depending on what the cytokine of interest was, one of two kits were used. The Luminex method is a 29-plex panel kit. It is basically an ELISA method for detection. And the MSD, or mesoscale discovery method, uses electrochemiluminescence to measure the cytokine levels. Results comparing cytokine values, clinical pathology, and daily observations are outlined here. The analytes with asterisks will be described further in the next few slides. As you can see, increases in cytokines were observed along with increases in serum chemistry parameters such as CRP, BUN, ALT, and AST. These quantitative findings also coincided with clinical observations of emesis hunched posturing, inappetence, and even abnormal coloring, such as bruising. This graph illustrates the previous table showing, over time, IL-6 increasing along with levels of BUN in two animals. Additionally, emesis was observed on day one in both animals. IL-6 is considered a pro-inflammatory cytokine, and BUN is an indicator for kidney function. Here, the same two animals also had elevated MCP-1, that increased along with CRP. Both animals were observed with hunched posture on day nine, and uh, MCP1 is a chemokine that attracts monocytes. CRP is a serum chemistry parameter that's an indicator for inflammation. On another study, two animals with elevated TNF-alpha also had elevated CRN with hunched posture and emesis on day two after dose administration. TNF-alpha is another pro-inflammatory cytokine, and CRN is a biomarker for kidney function. These same two animals also had elevated IL-6 and BUN, also pro-inflammatory markers for kidney. By day three, animal C, which is described in the blue columns, was determined in morbid condition and was euthanized on day three. Overall, data for 13 animals were analyzed both studies described were large molecule compounds dosed intravenously. In one study, cytokine and chemokine increases started one hour after dosing and peaked at eight hours. The increases were transient and returned to predose levels within 48 hours after dosing. Dosed animals showed increases in IL-6 and MCP-1 and corresponded with blood chemistry parameters, CRP, BUN levels. In the other study, emesis and hunched posture were observed in the same animals on day one. In a second set of animals, a more robust increase in TNF-alpha and IL-6 was observed. The levels peaked at one hour and eight hours after dosing, respectively. These cytokine increases corresponded with increases in BUN and CRN. Animals displayed hunched posture and emesis on day two, and the one animal was euthanized on day three. In conclusion, it's useful to evaluate cytokine levels in conjunction with other parameters such as serum chemistry and clinical observations. Increases in cytokines correlate with changes in serum chemistry, and although it's not an exhaustive analysis, it is a good starting point in having a more robust safety assessment for non-clinical drug development. And that concludes my overview of the poster presentation. I'll answer a couple questions, and thank you everyone again for your time.
to the first question I have, asks how many studies were evaluated and what kind of test article was used on these studies. Excellent question. For this project, we looked through data across 10 different studies. We wanted to find studies where there were immune responses observed and test article related effects, which reduced the number of total studies um, when discussing this presentation. The test articles used on all of these studies were large molecule compounds with two the two studies of interest being antibodies in particular. The next question I have asks, which platform would, rec would you recommend when measuring the cytokines? So with, uh, with the Luminex versus the MSD, um, the Luminex offers, uh, it can test more types of cytokines and is really preferred when we aren't quite sure what the immune response may be. So we have the test kit for 29 different cytokines and it kind of is more of a discovery um, type kit or test and it is useful if there are, if the immune response is not, it's not quite known. The MSD platform is, is pretty nice. It is more sensitive and it does require less sample volume for testing. And that's generally helpful when there's a lot of blood collections and you gotta limit your blood volume considerations. The MSD is also preferred when you have a specific type of cytokine in mind that you wanna monitor. So those, those discussions are usually taking place beforehand when designing the study and communication with the sponsor is always um, helpful in determining what the goal is on the study. And those complete the questions. Our next speaker today is uh, Milan Patel. Milan joined the Analytical Biology Department of Alta Sciences in 2018. With over eight years' experience in immunology and flow cytometry, Milan brings a wealth of experience to support custom method development for extracellular and intracellular flow cytometry assays in both tissues and peripheral blood. Prior to joining Alta Sciences, Mellon graduated from the University of Massachusetts Medical School with a doctorate in immunology. And during his dissertation, Mellon explored mechanisms of innate immune responses to infectious diseases. And Mellon's topic today is analysis and comparison of major immune cell populations in peripheral blood of naive synomologous monkeys. Mellon? Hello, everyone. My name is Milan Patel. I am a scientist in the flow cytometry group at Alta Sciences. Thank you so much for taking the time to tune into the webinar today. And Tina, thank you so much for the introduction. Today I'll be presenting an analysis of major immune cell populations in peripheral blood of naive pseudomonas monkeys. This analysis was done using a flow cytometry data from, at Alta Sciences. Because immune cell populations play a significant role in maintaining health of an organism, any changes can signal a significant major safety issue during clinical testing. As a result, these populations are frequently monitored during preclinical toxicology studies. The best way to monitor this population is using flow cytometry. If you look at the image to the right, we can see the various different immune cell populations that can be monitored by flow cytometry. The top, um, top image shows a cytogram that was, that was created after collecting data <clears throat> on a major missile population from peripheral blood. As you can see, flow cytometer can um, distinguish different cell populations based on size. The lymphocytes, which are the smallest, are shown at the bottom, followed by monocytes, which are slightly larger, and then the granulocytes at the top, which are the largest cells in the peripheral blood. These populations can be further divided into subpopulations based on the markers they expressed on the cell surface. So for example, if you follow the flow chart <clears throat> below, cells, lymphocytes that express CD3 marker on their cell surface are identified as total T cells. Total T cells can be further divided based on expression of CD4, which are known as helper T cells, or cells that express CD8 marker, which are, these cells are known as cytotoxic T cells. These cells play an important role in, in the adaptive immune response. CD4 T cells, for example, are important for the humoral response. CD8 cytotoxic T cells carry out targeted 
destruction of infected cells and tumor cells. On the right, cells that express CD20 receptor on their surface are called B cells. These cells are important for producing antibodies in response to an infection. Cells that express CD16 on their surface are called NK cells. These cells are responsible for nonspecific destruction of infected cells and tumor cells. The larger cells, monocytes, can be further enriched based on detection of expression of the marker CD14 on their cell surface. These cells are important for phagocytosis of cell debris, infected cells, and they're also important for antigen presentation, which then in initiates an adaptive immune response. The larger cells, the granulocytes, can be identified by the marker CD66 ABC that is present on their cell surface. And these cells are the first response <clears throat> following an infection. They're important for creating inflammation and destroying uh, infected cells. So far, even though these populations are routinely identified during preclinical testing, data is lacking on what constitutes a normal reading for this population. To bridge this knowledge gap, we created a large database using flow cytometry data at Alta Sciences, which consisted of 168 adolescent monkeys, which are aged between two to five years, and 33 infant synomogous monkeys, which are aged about 30 days, to establish uh, baseline values for major mesome populations listed below, which are the total T cells, helper T cells, cytotoxic T cells, B cells, NK cells, and monocytes. So to collect data for flow cytometry, we used the following assay. The assay involved using 100 microliters of peripheral blood from synomogous monkeys. The blood was incubated with an antibody cocktail that contained antibodies against markers CD3, CD4, CD8, CD20, CD16, and CD14. The, the samples were incubated with the antibodies for about 15, 20 minutes in the dark, and this step allows the antibodies to bind to the receptors on the cells. Following the incubation, a uh, lysing solution was added to the cells for about five to 12 minutes, and this step removes red blood cells that would interfere with data collection. After this step, the cells were washed once with the saline solution, resuspended in saline solution, and then analyzed on the cytometer. Okay, so the method that was used to analyze the data was shown below. The top two cytograms to the left show methods for excluding debris from the data. This method also removes cells that are stuck together to obtain a population of single cells. Once we gate on single cell population, we use this data to move to the third cytogram shown on top. And in this cytogram, we are differentiated cells based on size. The lymphocytes, which are smaller cells, are on the bottom, then monocytes, and then granulocytes at the top. The lymphocytes can be further divided into CD3 expressing cells, which are called CD3 T cells, as shown on the top right cytogram. And then the, after the CD3 positive T cells are gated on, we can gate on CD4 positive T cells, which is CD3, CD8 positive T cells, as shown on the bottom right cytogram. The lymphocytes can also be further divided into CD20 expressing cells, as shown in the bottom left cytogram, which are, these cells are called the B cells. And the CD16 positive NK cells can be identified as shown on the second cytogram on the bottom. The monocytes can be enriched by looking at expression of CD14 on the sulfur surface, as shown on the third cytogram on the bottom. The gates shown in these uh, cytograms give us a value for the relative percentage of these populations. Once we obtain the relative percentage of these populations, this data was used to calculate the total number or the absolute counts of cells present in the peripheral blood of synomogous monkeys. This was done by multiplying the relative percentage population values with the total counts of lymphocyte and monocytes obtained from a hematology analyzer. After this, after the values were obtained, we calculated the mean and standard deviations using Microsoft Excel. And we also conducted a statistical analysis 
using a Mann and Whitney test to check if there are any differences between these values based on age and gender of the Cynomolis monkeys. Any statistical significant results we obtained, they're marked with an asterisk. We found some very interesting differences between major missile populations based on gender and age of Cynomolis monkeys. So for example, we found that uh, CD3 positive total T cells, CD4 positive helper T cells, and CD14 positive monocytes, the relative percentage of these populations were much higher in infant Cynomolis monkeys compared to adolescent monkeys. However, on the other hand, the CD8 positive cytotoxic T cells and CD16 positive NK cells, the relative percentage of these populations were much lower in infant cells compared to adults and monkeys. Surprisingly, we also found some uh, differences in population based on gender. So for example, we saw that uh, the CD16 positive NK cell populations were much lower in female adults and monkeys compared to male adults and monkeys. Using the relative percentage populations reported in the previous chart, we calculated absolute counts of total T cells, CD4 T cells, CD8 T cells, B cell, NK cell, and monocyte population. And we charted them in a similar manner as shown below by gender and age. For the absolute count values, we found that uh, as similar to relative percentage counts, we saw that uh, the absolute counts of CD3 positive T cells, CD4 positive helper T cells, and CD4 14 positive monocytes were much higher in infant cynomogus monkeys compared to adolescent cynomogus monkeys. And again, NK cell values were lower in infant monkeys compared to adolescent monkeys. And we also saw gender-specific difference in absolute value counts, as we saw in relative percent populations, where female adolescent monkeys had lower absolute counts compared to male adolescent monkeys. Then we took the values shown in the, chart, in the previous slides, and we compiled the all the values in, as a, into a database that's shown in the table below. So table A here shows the all the compiled values for relative percentage of the major immune cell populations. And table B shows absolute counts per mill of blood of major immune cell populations in synomogous monkeys. This table can be used as a guideline for comparing values in the future for during preclinical testing. To conclude this presentation, we used a large database of 168 and 33 infant synomogous monkeys to establish normal values for major immune cell populations present in peripheral blood. Our analysis also identified statistically significant differences in these populations based on gender and age. These established values can be used <clears throat> as a guideline during preclinical research. They're especially useful for what a normal population looks like for studies that involved either a very small number of animals or studies that are lacking control groups. Thank you so much for taking the time to view my presentation. Now I can answer a few questions that I've received. The first question I, I was asked was, do you have any data to suggest that there are differences in the parameters between synomogous monkeys from Cambodia and other origins? This is an excellent question. All animals used for the current analysis are from the Cambodian origin. However, literature evidence does show some genetic variability between different origins of synomogous monkeys. As a result, I do expect to be some differences between Cambodia and other origins such as Mauritian. However, this is something I plan to identify in the future as we keep building our database and expand it to include synomogous monkeys from other origins. The second question I received was, have there been any reported differences in populations between synomogous monkeys compared to humans? This is also a very good question. And yes, there is some reported differences that have been observed in synomogous monkeys of Mauritian origin compared to humans. However, these differences were very minor. Uh, most of the majority of immune cell populations are very similar between synomogous monkeys and humans. However, again, this is a comparison between humans and synomogous monkeys is also something we plan to work on in the future as we expand our database. Our final speaker today is Andrea Wong. Andrea joined the analytical biology department in 2018. She has over 15 years experience in flow cytometry, spanning multiple species and tissues.
Andrea specializes in establishing and customizing flow cytometry assays, as well as recep receptor occupancy analyses for clients. Andrea graduated from the University of Toronto with a doctorate in immunology and completed postdoctoral training at Bloodworks Northwest in Seattle. And Andrea's topic today is assessment of receptor occupancy with flow cytometry, benefits and pitfalls of two common approaches. Andrea? So welcome everyone, welcome to this webinar today and thank you so much Tina for that kind introduction. I'm Andrea Wong, a scientist at Alta Sciences and I'm so pleased that you've joined me today. In my presentation today, I will be giving a brief introduction on the two methods that we've used to assess receptor occupancy via flow cytometry at Alta Sciences and then I'll give some examples on how on these methods were applied and then present some of the benefits and pitfalls of these approaches. So what is receptor occupancy assay, or RO in short? RO assays are used to monitor the binding of a therapeutic candidate to its cellular target. In the preclinical setting, the therapeutic candidate is often referred to as the test article, and in, this is the term that I'll be using for here onwards. So an, an RO assay aims to answer several important questions such, such as, what is the percentage of the target receptor that's bound by the test article? And this parameter is known as the percentage of bound receptor. And conversely, what is the percentage of the target receptor that is not bound by the test article? And this parameter is known as the percentage of free receptor, intuitively. And lastly, an ROSA can also assess the total receptor, which is the total target receptor available for binding by the test article. So what is receptor occupancy assay, or RO in short? RO assays are used to monitor the binding of a therapeutic candidate to its cellular target. In a preclinical setting, the therapeutic candidate is often referred to as a test article. And this is the term that I'll be using for here onwards. So RO assays aim to set, answer several important questions, such as, what is the percentage of the target receptor that is bound by the test article? And this parameter is known as the percentage of bound receptor. And conversely, what is the percentage of the target receptor that is not bound by the test article? And intuitively, this is known as the percentage of free receptor. And lastly, an RO assay can also assess the total receptor, which is the total target receptor available for binding by the test article. So why is flow cytometry ideal to assess receptor occupancy? As you will see later in the presentation, flow cytometry allows for simultaneous measurement of multiple cell populations because now we can stain the samples with different antibodies, conjugate it to distinct fluorochromes, and this really enables us to parse out various cell populations of interest. And furthermore, we can assess RO on rare or specialized cell populations such as activated T cells or T regulatory cells, which makes up less than 1% of the lymphocyte population in peripheral blood. So let's jump right into the two methods we have used to assess RO here at Alpha Sciences. So the first method uses competing and non-competing antibody to assess free and total receptors respectively. So let me explain. A competing antibody, as shown here in orange, is an antibody that competes with a test article for binding to its cellular target. The non-competing antibody, as shown here in purple, is an antibody that binds to a different epitope from the test article. So let's look at the two scenarios on the saturating and non-saturating amount of test article. When test article is at saturating amount, one would expect that the competing antibody will no longer be able to bind to its target, while at non-saturating amount of test article, we observe binding of competing antibody to its target. The binding of the non-competing antibody, however, is typically unaffected by the levels of test article and can be used to monitor total receptor available at various time points. So as you can imagine, the identification and the characterization of the competing and non-competing antibodies during the assay design phase can be quite labor intensive. Often the competing antibody is the test article itself, conjugated the fluorogram, and now used as a staining reagent. The, the identification of a non-competing antibody, however, can take quite some time. 
And from our experience, it's often the limiting step that prevents investigators from implementing their assay in an animal study. So the first method uses competing and non-competing antibody to assess free and total receptors respectively. So let me explain. A competing antibody, as shown here in orange, is an antibody that competes with the test article for binding to its cellular target. The non-competing antibody, as shown here in dark purple, is an antibody that binds to a different epitope from the test article. So let's look at the two scenarios, unsaturating and non-saturating amount of test article. When test article is at saturating amount, one would expect that the competing antibody to no longer be able to bind to the target, while at non-saturating amount of test article, we observe binding of the competing antibody to its target. The binding of the non-competing antibody, on the other hand, is typically unaffected by the levels of test article and can be used to monitor total receptor available at various time points. So as you can imagine, the identification and characterization of these non-competing and, non and competing antibodies in method one during the assay setup phase can be quite labor intensive. Often the competing antibody is the test article itself conjugated to a fluorochrome and now used as a staining reagent. The identification of non-competing antibody, however, can take quite some time. And from our experience, it's often the limiting step that prevents investigators from implementing their assay in an animal study. So and then that brings me to the second method. In this second method, only one secondary antibody is needed to measure both bound and total receptor. And that's shown here in the light purple. So the secondary antibody is often a commercial anti-human IgG antibody that recognizes the FC portion of the test article. So how does this work? So first, samples from the animals, animals that have been dosed with the test article were split into two separate tubes. In the first tube, the samples were incubated with PBS and then stained with the secondary antibody to measure bound receptor. In the second tube, saturating amounts of test article were added in vitro to fully saturate all targets. And this allowed us to measure the total receptor available for binding. So now that we've talked about the basics of how these two methods work, let's look at, look at specific examples. So recall that the first method uses competing antibody to measure free receptor and non-competing antibody to measure total receptor. In this example, samples were collected and stained with not just competing and non-competing antibodies, but also antibodies against CD20 and HLADR. The goal here was to assess the binding of test article to HLADR positive CD20 negative cells the cell population highlighted in purple. Samples were taken from animals prior to dosing and also on day one after dosing with the test article. So now let's focus on the top row of histograms where competing antibody was used to assess free receptor. Prior to dosing, there's high binding of the competing antibody measured by the mean fluorescence intensity or MFI in short. And after dosing on day one, we see a drop in binding and the MFI decreasing to 10% of its initial value. In contrast, the binding of non-competing antibody as shown here in the bottom row, pretty much stayed the same pre and post dose. So now when this assay was performed at multiple time points after dosing, we can generate a curve to monitor the receptor occupancy of this test article. And this is how the data looks like, where we have plotted the MFI of competing and non-competing antibody on the y-axis between pre-dose and day 17. You'll notice that the MFI of the competing antibody shown here in green dropped dramatically on day one and then slowly increased over time by day 13 has pretty much returned to pre-dose levels. The other thing that you will notice is that the MFI of the non-competing antibody, while it was stable across all time points, were significantly lower than the MFI of the competing antibody. This difference in MFI was likely due to two reasons. 
The different fluorochromes used between the two antibodies, where the competing antibody was conjugated to Alexa 647, a much brighter fluorochrome than Alexa 488. The other factor that likely contributed to this difference was simply because these were two different antibodies with two different binding affinities to the target. Now, given these differences in fluorochrome brightness and antibody affinities, we can't just simply calculate the percentage of free receptor by normalizing the MFI of the competing antibody to the MFI of non-competing antibody. The calculation of percentage of free receptor at each time point post-dosing should really be normalized to data collected as pre-dose, as shown in the formula listed here. So at pre-dose, the percentage of free and total receptors should be set to 100%. So the middle graph here gives us a very good idea of the receptor occupancy of this drug, where the peak receptor occupancy was noted on day one, which has the lowest percentage of free receptors. Now you'll notice that the percentage of total receptor dips slightly around days four and seven. And this can be due to down, possibly down, you know, down regulation or shedding of the target after dosing. Now the beauty of measuring total receptor concurrently with free receptor is that now we can adjust the calculation of free receptor to total receptors available. This is especially important if you suspect that your cellular target might undergo receptor modulation in response to test article treatment. So let me summarize what are some of the important things to consider during the assay design for this method. I have noted that the identification of competing and non-competing antibodies can be quite time consuming. I haven't discussed in, this in detail, but once the competing and non-competing antibodies have been identified, it is then essential to perform titrations of these reagents and fully characterize both antibodies prior to implementing the RO assay on animal samples. I've also showed you an example of why normalization to pre-dose is best when calculating the percentage of free and total receptor. And finally, why is it important to measure total receptor when you suspect that your test article can lead to shedding or downregulation of the receptor? So let's switch gears to look at the second method. So recall in a second method, a single commercial secondary antibody is often used to measure both bound and total receptor. So this is done by splitting the study samples into two, such that tube one measures bound receptor, and tube two, which is saturated with test article in vitro, measures total receptor. So in this example that I'm showing you, the, same, the samples were also staying with antibodies against CD3 and CD20, so we can assess the binding of the test article to CD3 positive, CD20 negative cells, or more commonly known as T cells. So let's focus on the histograms generated from tube one. As you would expect, prior to dosing and in the absence of test article, the binding shown here really reflects the background signal. And after dosing on day one, we see an increase in MFI and an appearance of a positive population. So this is the subpopulation of CD3 positive T cells with test articles found on its cell surface. In tube two, where we are measuring total receptor, we can see that the MFI between both days have been pretty much comparable. So here's the curve if we plot the FMI from both tubes collected at pre-dose through day 28. You'll notice that the green curve, which tracks the MFI from tube one, peaks around day 13, and by day 28 has pretty much dropped to half of the pre-dose level. The red curve, on the other hand, which measures total receptor, has been pretty much stable with only a slight decrease between days 7 and 10. So the other thing that I'm sure you appreciate is that because now we're using a single secondary antibody to measure both bound and total receptor, we can now normalize the MFI from tube 1 to the MFI to tube 2, as shown here in the formula, formula listed here. And from the curve shown on the right, we can see that there is close to 100% receptor occupancy on days between 7 and 13. So now before I show you the next slide, I want you to try to remember the graph on the left here. And then compare that to the graph that I'm going to show you next. In this current graph, the MFI in tube 2 is always higher than the MFI in tube 1. 
And that totally makes sense because the bound receptive measure in tube one is always going to be a subset of the total receptive measure in tube two. So here's the graph that I wanted you to compare the previous graph to. The data I'm showing you here is from a different test article than the previous slide. At predose, the staining pattern of this test article was comparable to what we observed previously, where a low MFI was noted in tube one and predose. And this makes sense because there's absence of test article and a relatively higher MFI in tube two at the same time point. However, if you, if you focus on the red line, you'll see that the MFI from tube two decreased on days one through 28. And this is true when you compared it to pre-dose and also when you compared it to tube one. So this was really puzzling to, to us because how is it possible that the number of total receptors be lower than the bound receptor, especially when we're using the same detection antibodies in both tubes? So while we haven't quite figured out definitively yet, we think that the lower expression of the target receptor in tube two was likely due to receptor modulation following re-exposure to the test article in vitro. So recall that this method relies on the incubation of the samples from test article in vitro to measure total receptors available. And tube one, which was incubated with PBS instead of test article was unaffected by receptor modulation. So then this brings me to some considerations in asset design for this second method. So based on our previous experience, the selection of a good secondary antibody is crucial for the success of this assay. We highly, highly recommend that if your test article is of a human IgG isotype, that the secondary detection antibody used in the ROSA be pre-absorbed against NHP antibodies to minimize cross-reactivity. If your target cells are monocytes, sticky cells, such as monocytes and granulocytes, the secondary antibody can have a major impact on the resolution between signals and noise. In addition to carefully selecting a secondary antibody, a good, good blocking reagents with appropriate wash that's incorpor incorporated into the staining protocol will help to minimize nonspecific binding. So lastly, as we observed in previous slide, receptor modulation can occur in tube two, and from our experience, this has been really test article dependent. We highly recommend that the effects of target and engagement by the test article be invest investigated in vitro prior to implement implementing the RO assays in animal studies. So here's a high level summary of the two methods I've discussed today. In method one, competing antibody was used to measure free receptor and non-competing antibody was used to measure total receptor. In this method, we are able to multiplex both antibodies and stain only one tube per sample. However, the identification and optimization of these detection antibodies can often take a long time and can often be a limiting step to get the assay up and going. In the second method, a single secondary antibody is used to measure both bound and total receptor. Multiplexing is not possible as samples must be split into two tubes for incubation with either PBS or test article and this leads to higher numbers of tubes to process. The advantage of this assay is that it has a much shorter lead time than the first method, as the detection antibody is often readily available. However, as discussed previously, receptor modulation following the exposure to test article in vitro may occur, although this appears to be highly test article dependent. And lastly, regardless of the method that you choose, it is always a good idea to involve your CRO as early as possible in the assay design process, and always allow for plenty of time for assay development prior to start of animal studies. Thank you so much for listening to this webinar, and I'll be happy to take any questions. So the first question that I have here is, Setting aside the technical challenges that you've listed on your summary slide, are there any other factors that make one method more favorable than the other? Well, that's a great question. Um, in my opinion, the expression level of your cellular target, so if your target is expressed at a rather low level or so-called dim expression, I would recommend using the second method to measure bound and total receptors. So as it's because the detection with a secondary antibody and in a so-called two-step staining method typically results in a much brighter signal than staining with a primary antibody, such as the one that we used in the first method. 
And on the other hand, if your target cells are sticky cells, such as neutrophils and monocytes, establishing a good method with the secondary antibody will be quite challenging, but in our experience, it's still doable. So in that case, if you have sticky cells and neutrophils, you might want to consider using the first method first. And the second question that I have here is that, does the RO assay have to be done on fresh blood? So, so far, all the assays that we've done have been on fresh blood. We've also done our all on freshly isolated PBMC. Well, having said that, I think it's possible to use uh, blood preserved in stabilizing reagents, such as those in Cytocheck. But that possible, you know, it really depends on the test article and its cellular target, and this really should be tested at the, the, the method development phase. So that con concludes our SOT virtual poster session for today. There were many questions that were submitted that we didn't have time for, and we will uh, answer those separately for you. Thank you again for attending.